Jazak khairan and welcome to another MYP. Tonight's topic about the hudud, clarifying the controversy about the hudud. We all have some sort of an idea about what the sort of criminal justice system or the punishment in Islam is. And we, have, we can see the stark contrast between the, this system in Islam and the system in the West. And we can see how the system in the West, the system of incarceration, has completely failed. All that is happening within the Western system is that young people are going into jails and becoming hardened criminals. And the West have called, uh, called the Hudud many names. They have called it backward. They have called it barbaric. They have said it is, you know, it is, it is from the time of the caveman and things like that. But tonight we would wish to enlighten the audience about the, about the truth about Hudud and why it is important and why it is the only punishment system that works. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Brother Sudad to enlighten, enlighten us, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. All praises due to Allah. May the peace and blessings be upon His beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. The topic given to me today was clarifying the controversy about the hudud. The hudud are part of the penal code and the punishment systems set down by Islam by Allah سبحانه وتعالى. For those that transgress under an Islamic state, under an Islamic society. Um, but before we have this discussion, we really need to understand its political context um, and what it means for the Muslims because this discussion is not being had in a vacuum. Yeah, and what I mean by that is uh, we need to ask ourselves why are we having a discussion in the first place? Is it a result of Muslims looking inwardly? Um, seeking to, to critique and analyze and come up with the solutions from Islam in order to clarify some misconceptions about Islam, uh, by far that is not the case. The reality is very, very much that we're having this discussion because it's part of a wider um, narrative being perpetuated by um, the Wests and the Kuffar in general um, to impress a particular idea upon the Muslims, um, to create a doubt in the minds of Muslim youth in their Islam to create controversy about Islam such that the non-Muslims do not want to seek solutions outside of their, the, the realm of what they're offered in terms of secular liberal values and the kufr ideas and culture around them. Um, and they seek to demonize the Sharia, demonize Islamic law. That's why we have um, so many attacks in front of us about the Sharia law, attacks about the hijab, attacks about the niqab, um, constantly we have politicians and media, even some Islamic so-called thinkers um, raising the issue about how the hudud and the punishment system under Islam is so barbaric. Right? Barbaric, if you look it up in the, in, in the dictionary, basically it's talking about being primitive and inhumane. Right? But again, when you talk about inhumane, right? inhumane is um, not very objective. Right? It's a subjective ideal. Um, it comes from the background and the culture of that uh, individual perpetuating that idea. Um, so what we really want to do is take a step back. And we need to understand this discussion is not merely raised by Muslims that just want clarification on an issue. It is a result of, uh, you know, over a century of bombardment um, against Islam to really shake, to create hesitation in the Muslim youth, and, and, and to really create a discomfort in discussing these matters. So when we talk about the punishment system for the murtad, the one that leaves Islam, or the homosexual, and the position of Islam on uh, zina and adultery, etc., they want to shake our foundations and our confidence in Islam to solve the society's problems. Let me mention that in the past, the colonialist nations like Britain and France, they used to use this idea and this concept that you know the Islamic system is one of you know being barbaric and backward and very primitive, right? So they used to use this to justify um, them entering the Muslim lands in order to colonize the Muslim countries, which they did for a very long period of time, to rescue these backward Muslims, these uh, poor uh, women and children from the clutches of an oppressive male-dominated religion uh, by an, an unmerciful God. And this is the context that um, they sought to colonize. And they did that in order to marginalize the Islamic Sharia, right? And, and, and to demonize it. 
And what they were trying to demonize was the political Islam. They did not care about, um, you know, if you pray, if you fast, if you, you, you know, you enjoy the month of Ramadan or you go to Hajj. What they sought to do was to demonize the political aspects of Islam, those aspects which sought to be implemented in a society, uproot any existing kufr system, unite the Muslim ummah upon them, and live according to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So by doing that, by being able to shake those foundations, they were seeking to replace them with their secular democratic laws and systems, which they did, and they successfully were able to do it in the Muslim lands after colonizing it uh, militarily, economically, ideologically. And unfortunately, we've, we've seen the fruits of those over the last one or 200 years across the Muslim world, and we continue to do that. And it is within this context that we also see, since the Arab Spring and the Muslim uprisings, especially in, in Syria and in Bilad al-Sham and, and across Africa and Egypt, um, the momentum for this attack on Islam has picked up its pace. And they do that again for the same purpose, which is to marginalize Islam, create doubt and fear and intimidation in the hearts of both the Muslims and non-Muslims, and to justify their foreign policies in the Muslim countries. So yes, we're allowed to go send our armies and bomb Afghanistan, send drone strikes over Yemen and kill every man, woman and child in that village. Why? Because these are barbaric, backward people seeking to implement this religion of Islam which belongs in the Stone Ages. And this is the narrative that they perpetuate. And it is unfortunate that some Muslims have fallen for this hook, line and sinker. Because part of this goal is to really create an apologetic Muslim. A Muslim that now seeks to expend all of his energies apologizing for Islam, trying to sugarcoat Islam, create a more palatable version of Islam for the dominant race or the dominant power in authority. And so in the, Muslim, in the Western countries, that is basically appeasing the Western governments, the media, um, academia, everyone in that fight against Islam to appease them, to show, no, 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 we're not barbaric guys, we're just like you, just find the differences. And unfortunately, a lot of Muslims have fallen into this trap. And, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of, not only just regular Muslims, but mashayikh, and leaders of communities and organizations have fallen into this trap. Because what we're seeing after all of this attack on Islam, they present to us honor killings, right? So they show us honor killings, on a killings in Pakistan. They show us kidnapping of schoolgirls and uh, enforcement of hijab and, and, uh, and, and forcing them to embrace Islam, for example. They show us video footage, um, even more recently, of um, the call to kill and take the life of um, those who attack Islam or those who have left Islam, right? They were once upon Islam and, and became murtadin and, and left the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and started really attacking Islamic ideals. So they you know, really have flooded our, our screens. Even yesterday or the other day, I saw there was now a fatwa on a chocolate company, right? Because it included pig DNA in some of its chocolates, right? Whatever that means. How do you take a fatwa out on a chocolate company? But it's to show the barbarity of Islam in their, in their Western lenses or through their Western lenses. And so we need to understand this is the framework in which we are having this discussion. So when we hear Western politicians saying that we need to save Muslims from this inhumane law and rescue them with our secular democratic values, we need to understand this is part of a wider, very well calculated political agenda against Islam and the Muslims globally. Right? That's where we're having this discussion. Right? They seek to propagate a secular form of Islam one devoid of a solution, being able to govern all of society with the rules and regulations. And so, punishments of apostasy, adultery, honor killings, um, homosexuality, or even they're showing us oh, a woman that's even raped, she gets punished or stoned to death, all right? So all this peddling of misinformation deliberately um, is to undermine the foundations of Islam and the belief of the Muslims and to keep them in a weak, subservient position, constantly defending their Islam, 
um, constantly hiding these aspects of Islam, trying to sugarcoat these elements of Islam. And when you do that, you compromise the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it's not, not yours to compromise. An example recently we saw is Australian National Imams Council released a, uh, a press release a number of days ago. And it was in response to um, the New South Wales Counterterrorism Unit Assistant uh, Commissioner um, issued, uh, issued a statement saying that the Muslim community in Australia and its leaders, more specifically, are not doing enough to stop Muslim youth from supporting right, or going or wishing or desiring to go support the jihad in Bilad the Sham in Syria. So the the group of imams, and the ANIC, Australian National Imams Council, issued a press release, and they were absolutely disgusted. Okay, when I saw that, I said, okay, pretty good. Let's take the good with the bad. I saw the headline, but they condemned this statement. But upon reading it, they were condemning it because they were saying, no, we are on the front lines of this work. How can you discount all of our effort to stop the support for the Mujahideen in Syria? So the Mufti, along with Mashayikh, Allahu alam how many in, in this organization, a representative across the country, were upset at the Kafir's attack upon them, not because it was false, but because they thought they had done more than their fair share in this war against radicalization and terrorism. Despite Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودَ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَبِعْ مِلَّتُهُمْ That never will the Jews and the Christians ever be pleased with you until you follow their millah, their way, their belief system, until you really throw and strip away all of your Islam. That's when they'll be pleased with you. So despite, well, subhanAllah, despite everything they've been doing, all these organizations in the Muslim community have been taking the funding, taking the money, running courses, anti-radicalization courses, sending a mashayikh to, 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 to learn from um, anti-terrorism, anti-radicalization experts. After all that, they've said, hang on, it's still not enough? Have they not seen the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this shows you how... The Muslims are being asked to engage on the basis of the game set for us by the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, they were offended. <laughs> they were offended. But an important point that we want to have in this discussion is that we should not think, when we're discussing different laws, different systems, different punishment systems, right, that uh, we should be looking to one that it's going to eradicate all crime. Right? No system is going to eradicate crime. Right? Even Islam. Islam will not eradicate crime. We are, we are not um, uh, an angelic race. We are not an angelic society. Human beings will fall into error and haram and fasad and corruption. And the shaitan has been allowed and given reign to whisper and to allow and seek to deviate the Muslims. And this is part of the test which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for us. So we should not... The, so the measurement here is which one is the perfect one and going to eradicate all crime, right? So someone says, look, will Islam remove all drug addiction or alcoholism in a society? We'll say no. But it will reduce you to the utmost maximum that you could achieve. Will Islam remove all theft? No. That's why the punishment system is there. Because obviously someone's still going to steal. And we'll get into the, those details a little bit later on, inshallah ta'ala. But let us ask, where do laws come from? When we talk about laws, when we talk about systems, when we talk about how to live our life, um, if you look to the, the secular framework under democracy, the laws are made via a process of legislation via the parliament to so-called represent the, the, the majority view of the people, right? So, in theory. So... It's, it's the desires and the whims of the people. They will legislate that via a parliament system who so-called represents these people and then it becomes enacted as law. And therefore, everyone in a society has to follow it. Under Islam, it's different to this. Under Islam, laws are not legislated by human beings. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in al hukmu illa lillah. Verily, the ruling and the judgment is none to is to none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the definition of law and ahkam sharia and rules of the sharia in Islam it is khitab sharia muta'allik bi af'al al ibad. It is the address of the legislator. It means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the legislator, he addresses you. Muta'allik bi af'al al ibad. It is the address of Allah when He addresses you regarding your actions. This is the Sharia in Islam. This is the definition. So, it means for us extracting the rules from the Quran and the Sunnah, right, to the, our utmost best by ulama and scholars, etc., to reflect what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has requested of us. And we just implement them. So, whereas under the secular framework and, and democratic framework, those rules, those laws, those God are according to the whims and the desires of the people. Under Islam, we don't have a piece of that action. It's not our role. It is absolutely not our role. It is the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to decide what is right or wrong, what is good or bad, what is moral or what is immoral, and not up to the human beings. And there are many reasons for this. We need to understand that Islam is all-encompassing as a result of this. Because it comes from Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, it covers everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَنَزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ هُدَى وَرَحْمًا وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ And we had revealed down to you this book, the Quran, along with it, the Sunnah, its clarification, etc. تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ Clarifying everything about this life. هُدَى وَرَحْمًا وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ as guidance and as mercy, and as good news, glad tidings of Jannah for those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every problem that human beings have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down a solution for it. Nothing has been left. There is nothing that is, cannot be extracted from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to solve the affairs and look after the affairs of mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions, وَالْتِلْكَ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ وَمَا يَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهِ And these are the hudud, the limits, and the laws set down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever exceeds these hudud, whoever exceeds these limits and these laws set down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has wronged and oppressed his own soul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set those limits. Imam Sayfuddin al-Amidi, a, a, a very notable classical scholar, he wrote in his famous work on jurisprudence, Al-Ihkam Fi Ulum Al-Ihkam. He said, you should know that there is no judge and there's no arbiter, so someone who judges between the right and the wrong, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is no judgment but His. A necessary entailment of this proposition, of this idea, is that human reasoning cannot declare things to be good or bad. Human beings by themselves cannot declare something as good or bad. It needs a high, higher being to understand that. Because what you might think is good, I might think is bad. Why? Because it's on the basis of maslah. It's a basis of benefit. Everyone right, will see what's good for him. So if you were to ask the, uh, the multi-million dollar owner, a multi-billion dollar owner of um, you know, Westfield, for example, or... Um, Gina Reinhardt, who owns Australia, you know, one of Australia's richest people, owns all the mines and coal mines and gas mines and exploration and oil, etc. If you were to ask them about distribution of wealth, they'll say, no, 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 no. No, no, I'm holding all of this and there's nothing immoral about what I'm doing. Yes, there are people dying. Yes, I'm kicking Aboriginals off the land. Yes, I'm polluting their, 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 their waters, right, with, uh, with, with chemicals, which is forcing them to, to leave the land and it's killing the habitats around them, that's not immoral. I'm helping human beings and human progress. Right? So, so everyone's got an argument for themselves. And if it doesn't come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it comes from their own mind. So he continued in his statement and he said, Therefore, there is no rule and there's no judgment before the revelation of the sharia. That's the only place you have judgment and revelation. You refer everything to Allah and His Messenger. Absolutely, unequivocally. Another point we need to understand is the idea of this morality, immorality, right? The moral compass, again, is not static among humanity, 
right? Everyone has their own opinion. Everyone has their own ideas. If it's not going to be rooted in a religious dogma and a religious belief, it's going to be rooted in the secular framework and values around freedom, about, about um, 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 individualism. And this is what I just mentioned earlier. Everyone is in it for themselves, right? So if we talk about morals, talk about moral compass, a, a thief will say, listen, I've got no problem at all that I've left this rich guy, um, you know, $100 shorter, right? The guy's got more than enough money. I don't have enough. I'm just going to steal it from him. How, well, how is that immoral? Right? Because it's using his own mind. And human beings, if they were to use their own mind, they'll fall into error every single time. This is because we are fallible. We are prone to bias and corruption and error. We're human beings. So what I might think is correct, you might think is dis- incorrect. What I think is correct now may be incorrect and change my mind in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, 100, 200. Human beings, 500 years down the track, may look back and say, look how ridiculous that decision was. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His decisions from the beginning of revelation until the day of judgment. Because He's the owner and the creator of the heavens and the earth. He knows and He fashioned us. He knows what is good for us and what is bad for us. And this is a very, very important concept that we need to understand. Human beings are not in any position, way, shape or form, to legislate laws or to issue verdicts on morality. And when you have a discussion, for example, with the ex-Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, she was a self-proclaimed atheist, yet she stood against homosexuality. She stood against homosexual, sorry, she stood against homosexual marriage, not homosexuality. And so when they ask her, on what basis do you reject it? She has no answer. She said, traditionally, marriage is between a man and a woman. On what basis do you make that assumption? If it wasn't for religion stipulating that, no one would say it's originally between a man and a woman. Just because the majority of the world is in that situation. But where is it grounded, that belief? So in reality, she should, according to her analysis, not have any problem with it whatsoever. Furthermore, if you want to go further, if a person wanted to marry his pet dog, why would you be against that? Bestiality. Who said you cannot enjoy the the sexual activity with an animal? This is how perverted that thinking is. Right? Or with a, a, a father and his daughter, or a mother and her grandson, or a grandmother and her grandson. If it wasn't by wahi and revelation, grounded in some religious dogma, religious belief, whether it be Christianity, Judaism, or even Buddhism, right? Or Islam, then on what basis do you make judgments of morality? And they can't. And they will fail every time. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us, taught us through the Prophet sallam how we work in the society to protect the society, to protect the deen, and to protect the human beings in every sphere of work. The other very important point we need to understand here is the definition of society. When you look to the West, when they attack Islam and they attack all of us, they look at the definition of society as merely being a collection of individuals. They say, we are a group of individuals, So satisfy the needs and the instincts and the desires of that individual, every one of them. Let them do anything they want, hence the absolute freedom. Let them do what they want, fulfill their desires, and then if everyone's desires are fulfilled, we won't have any problems in society, in theory. Whereas under Islam, we look at it differently. Under Islam, society is not merely a collection of individuals. Just as much as... 50,000 soccer supporters in a stadium is not considered a society. It's just a group of individuals that are there. But society is a collection of individuals along with all the laws and the systems and the beliefs and the sentiments that unite them and govern them. This is what a society is. So 50,000 people in a sports stadium is not considered a society. They're not bound by anything there except the passion for the sport. 
but 100 people in a remote Aboriginal village that has laws and systems governing between them, we consider that as being a society. And so that's a very big fundamental difference because in Islam, it is not all about the individuals. Rather, importance is placed upon the holistic preservation of society, the family unit, the people, the individuals, the groups, the extended family, the relationships, all of it, there is importance in it. And so when they come to us and they say, why do you want to kill this person if he leaves his Islam? He's only harming himself, we say that is incorrect. Not only has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated it, but the harm extends and reverberates throughout society. Why is this person who's a homosexual, why do you have a problem with him and you want to chuck him off the highest cliff you can find? He's only harming himself. No, that is not the case. He is spreading munkar and fahshat within the society and he's transgressing upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, worthy of the punishment that his creator who created him has sent down for him. And so as Muslims, one of the biggest tenets of Islam is enjoining in what is right and forbidding what is haram. It is not merely about nafsi, nafsi, looking after myself. It is enjoining the good. When you see the munkar, remove it. Do your absolute best to remove it. And enjoin on the good. And this is the day-to-day -day life of the Muslim. Absolutely. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he describes society in a beautiful hadith, he gave an analogy. He said, society is like a group of people who boarded a ship. So imagine, you've got a big boat, you've got a ship, it's about to start traveling down a stream. And he said, some people, they drew lots, so picked out of a hat. Some people ended up on the lower deck, some were on the upper deck that was exposed. So as they traveled down the stream, the Prophet is describing this analogy to society. As they were traveling down the stream, the people on the bottom, if they needed some water, they would knock on the guys on the upper deck, give them a bucket and say, please give us some water. They would get water off the side of the boat, bring it back and hand it back down. They started to annoy them. They said, look, why should we annoy those on the upper deck? Let's punch a hole in the bottom here of your ship and we'll get the water directly. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, if the good people on the top deck allowed those on the bottom to transgress, to do the haram, then what will happen? The entire boat will sink with the good and the bad. And this is exactly like society. If the good people shunned away, said, you know what, as long as they're doing their haram away from me, then the entire society would be destroyed. Instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that you hold their hand and you stop them from committing such an evil which will harm and destroy the entire society. And this is our view on society in Islam. So therefore, you can start now to get a bigger and wider context of how the implementation of Islam seeks to preserve the entire society, not just a single individual. Right? So yes, okay, one person may die by being punished, but you've saved a lot more than that. You've saved a lot more than that. You've saved people from the hellfire, for example. And we'll describe that a little bit later. So in Islam, in Islam, we need to understand a very important point. That the rules of Islam and the systems of Islam are not to be implemented in piecemeal, bit by bit, or in half, half effort. Rather, it must be implemented in totality. So the social system of Islam, the penal and punishment system of Islam, the political system of Islam, through the khilafah and the establishment of Islam, the economic system looking after the affairs of the people, right? All of that, the educational system, educating the people about what the halal and haram is, has to be implemented in its totality. Then you can come back and say, okay, with all of that implemented, the people's needs are looked after. If someone transgresses those limits... After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided everything for him, there's no excuses after that. And so in Islam, these punishments which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders, they were legislated in order to pre prevent people from the jara'im. The jara'im are the, the major crimes and major sins. These punishments are a reason for their legislation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاسِ حَيَاتِ And for you, 
in the retaliation of a life. So when somebody kills somebody else, the punishment is killing him. So a murderer, his punishment is death. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاسِ حَيَاتِ يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ O oh, you who reflect and think in order that you attain, attain ta- piety and taqwa. Right? There is life. Allah is saying, in taking the life of the murderer, there is life for you in the society. How is there life? I'm taking a life. How is that going to be life? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, in the legislation of retaliation, by killing the killer, the great wisdom is the survival and preservation of lives because the killer, if he knows he, that he will, if he takes a life, his life will be taken, he'll refrain from his action. He'll refrain from it. It does not take many instances of taking the life of a murderer for the rest of society to get it. Right? It does not take that many instances of it. And really, even throughout the time of the Prophet ﷺ and, and the Ashab of Rasulullah ﷺ and those generations after them, it wasn't rife. Even though Islam moved into so many different areas and its borders expanded, it wasn't rife. The taking of the life of murderers wasn't everywhere, which meant that it was working. It still took place. Murder still happened. Transgression took place. It's not an angelic society, nor is it a society built up only of Muslims. You have non-Muslims, Ahlul Dhimma, that live under Islam. And they may transgress the society too, transgress the laws of Islam as well. And so, when a person, any sane human being, who understands that if he commits his crime and he's caught, he will be killed, right, should be enough for him to refrain from that. And a beautiful hadith that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, he said, Ahad, in other words, a legal punishment, where Allah commanded to, 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 to apply upon the person. Ahad, punishment, acted upon the earth, is better for that place on earth than 40 days of straight rain. And he raining, rain, especially you can imagine at the time of the Prophet وسلم, they were in Mecca, they were in Saudi Arabia, that area. All right, of a desert um, in Medina. And it's desert, right? What would you do for 40 straight days of rain? Right? That, that would be like, you know, the, the most blessed occasion throughout that century. Here the Prophet Sallallahu said, implementing the hudud of Allah is much better for that land than 40 straight days of Allah's mercy of rain. All right, this is some of the, these are some of the wisdoms that we see that we can't acknowledge, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your creator, tells us about them. So Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, He commands us to do things and He prohibits us to do things. And if someone violates that, then they are punished. Very simple. There's a punishment for them. Otherwise, what would be the purpose of commanding and prohibiting? What is the purpose of Allah saying, do this or don't do this, the halal and haram, if there's no... Punishment for the one that chooses not to do it. I remember many years ago when I was young, I was in a shopping center, I was approached by a Mormon. And he said to me, do you believe? I said, absolutely. He said, do you believe? I said, absolutely. He said, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins? I said, absolutely not. I said, what a ridiculous argument you make he said what do you mean i said you come to invite me to a system where there's no accountability he said but god judges i guess if a man entered your home and he raped your wife what do you do he said jesus told us to turn the other cheek well he said that i gave you turn the other cheek and forgive him he said yeah only god can judge i go because you forgave him he came back the following week to harm your daughter. And the guy's going red in the face. I go, what would you do now? Go, what would you do? He wants to say, right? Because it sounds disgusting. I sit back. I forgive him. Right? But he has to say that. Because that's his, uh, you can't shake his, his belief there. But inside, I'll tear him to shreds. All right? I'll pick up the knife. I'll pick up a gun. That's what he wants to say. But he can't. I said, because your system does not have a, your, your, your beliefs, your religion does not have 
a system to organize the affairs of mankind. It is not enough to say, love for your neighbor that you, which you love for yourself. Okay, what if someone doesn't love his neighbor and he harms his neighbor and he steals from him? Because God will judge. Get out of here, man. Like, really? In all honesty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the halal and haram to judge the actions of mankind. Under an Islamic society, it is regulated not by the massive amounts of policing forces that you have. It is regulated by taqwa. Under an Islamic society, the first line of defense against crime and haram and fasad and corruption and zina and theft and, and taking of property and the taking of rights is taqwa of Allah. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. For those who do not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Umar radhi an said, verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts fear in men's hearts from the punishment of the Sultan, the Khalifa, for those who do not fear the punishment through the Quran. Okay? You're going to get people who don't care. Okay? Allah says he's going to punish me in the akhirah. It's not my problem. I want to deal with this dunya now. Maybe a kafir. Maybe a zindik. Maybe a munafik. Could not care less. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down a punishment for him in this life. For the one who does not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the akhirah. Which is the correct mode. So the normal day-to-day -day activities is that you fear Allah. Not like in this society. The yardstick of measurement is not the good or bad, the right or wrong, the legal or illegal. The yardstick of measurement is, can I get away with it? I want to do a U-turn at the traffic light. Are there any police around? I want to steal something from my work office. Is there a chance I can get away with it? In America, there was a survey on a college campus. If you could rape any girl you wanted on campus, with certainty you'd get away with it, would you do it? Overwhelmingly, over 70% said yes of males. I would get away with it. Every guy got in his head, some girl that he's been perving at, admiring, desiring since he started the college over there, they gave him an opportunity. If you would, would you? Absolutely. Why? Because if you remove the deterrent of being caught, but for the Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala catches everything. Nothing escapes the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first deterrent for the believers. And this might remove 80% of the haram and the munkar. Maybe even less. Does not matter. Right? And the rest of it is through education, ilm, punishment for those who do not. Who still transgress the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding the punishment in the akhirah, because you do the halal or the haram, or you refrain from them, there are two types of punishments, in the dunya and in the akhirah. And we don't want to confuse the two. Regarding the punishment in the akhirah, in the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who punishes. And this happens and occurs on a day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, criminals will be known by their marks, and they will be seized by their forelocks and their feet. They will be thrown into the night of Jahannam. So this belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He chooses on a day of judgment. If he wants to forgive, he'll forgive. He has that right. If he does not, he'll punish you. We cannot uh, bank on either way. It's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's right. But as for the punishment in this world, in the dunya, the khalifa or his jipiri is the one who undertakes it. So we need to understand all these punishments, all these crimes that everyone throws around, many of them are based on misinformation, and even the Muslims do not know that these punishments can only be implemented by the existence of a khalifa and an authority. The khalifa is the ruler over the Muslims who implements the Islamic laws and the systems over the people. He governs their affairs. He safeguards their honor, their property, and their blood. If someone transgresses the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is brought to his attention, then the punishment of Allah, then the punishment which Allah has sent down, is upon those people. But keep one thing in mind, that if you were to be punished in the dunya, it removes the punishment for your sin in the akhirah. So if you were punished by the Amir, by the Khalifa, for something stealing, you got your hand chopped off, you will not be punished for it in the akhirah. It's an expiation for it. 
And, and there are evidences around it, but I'm not going to go through all of those evidences. A woman from Johanna, I'll give you one example. She's from a, a tribe, an area of Johanna. She confessed to the Prophet Sallallahu that she committed zina. And she was stoned until she died. After the stoning, some of the companions, they one, one spat at her. So they, they actually, the, the punishment for, for, for zina and adultery are of two types. If it's fornication, fornication means the haram sexual relationship by non-married people. If they're non-married people and they commit it, then a the punishment is a hundred lashes. If any of them are married, the punishment is they are dug in dirt in, in the ground up to their waist, right? and they are stoned until they die. That's a punishment, which Allah and His Messenger have set down. Again, we refer everything to Allah and His Messenger because Allah knows best. We do not interfere in our mind and say, oh, hang on a second, is that fair? Just We need to understand and we'll go through what that does for the society, how that destroys the moral fabric of a society, how that destroys the family unit, how that destroys families, destroys children, destroys lineage. Yeah, just look at the society that we live in. Destroys women, destroys honor. Right? One act of zina <clears throat> by a married or non-married person. She's a daughter. He's a son. He's a brother. She is a sister. She is, she is a granddaughter of somebody. She is a niece of somebody. It affects the entire society when the honor is taken like this. So here, one of the companions spat on her. And the Prophet ﷺ said, do not do such a thing. He rebuked the incident. He said, for she repented so much, her repentance, if it was to be spread over Medina, it would suffice for them. In another narration, over 70 people of Medina. If her repentance, her forgiveness that Allah gave her was spread over 70 people, it would be enough for them. Enough meaning, sufficient for enough to get them into Jannah. That's it. Because she came to Rasulullah and confessed. She said, Ya Rasulullah, purify me. Purify me. Remove me of this sin. Right? She could have stayed quiet. And for your information, the Prophet and the companions, they didn't go hunting for who the companion was. There's no evidence for it. They didn't go hunting, all right, who'd she do it with? They didn't even grab her and say, all right, tell us who the other party was. No, she came forward and confessed and she got punished. And it takes a lot to come to the ruler and say, take my life, I've done a major crime, a major sin against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the punishment in this life for a sin is far less severe than a punishment in the akhirah. Far less. If you look to the hadith of the punishment that the mischievous or the kuffar or the Muslims that sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are punished with in the nar of Jahannam, you would weep. You would weep. That on a day a woman would drop her load. If she's pregnant, gone. Out comes the baby. That's how frightened she'll be. If she's got a baby in her arm, she will toss it. No one will recognize the other, even though all of them will be naked. You'll be punished, you'll be naked. And one of the companions said, Ya Rasulullah, won't everyone be shy and covering? He said, you think that's the least of your problems? You'll be so terrified you will not even notice anyone around you from the punishment of Allah. So now when we start to see the context, okay, maybe that isn't so bad after all, when you look at it. But it's still a big price to pay, your life. <clears throat> so the punishment in Islam occurs over three things. If you left a fard, which Allah commanded, you can be punished for it. If you did a haram, you can be punished for it. And the only other area where you can be punished under Islam is if you violated one of the commands and prohibitions issued by the Islamic State, the Khalifa. And it might not be a halal haram, but he says, everyone do this. And you don't do it, you can be punished for it. Not because the thing he commanded is halal haram, no, but it stays allowed, right? But what it does is, means you disobey the Khalifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul wa ulu lamri minkum. O oh, you who believe, obey Allah 
and obey the messenger and those in authority from amongst you. Obey Allah and the messenger and those in authority. Talking about the Amir, the Khalifa in this instance. And so these types of punishments under Islam are four types. They can be the hudud, which is part of the title of today. The hudud are those limits and punishments set down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly. Then there is something called the jinayat. The jinayat are very much like the hudud, except the difference between them is in the hudud, they are the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have been taken. No one can intercede. Once the issue has been brought to the khalifa, the punishment has to be taken. The Amir or the Khalifa can't forgive, nor can the family forgive. Nor can the, the owner, for example, of property forgive once it comes to the court of, of the state. Whereas the Jinayat, the right is with the people. And the Jinayat, an example, so the Hudud, for example, I'll go through them. They are, very, they are limited to six types. And the Jinayat, for example, is like murder. So murder is not one of the Hudud. It's called jinayat, where by it is the right of the, 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 the one who is the owner of the blood. And what it means is, for example, if someone is murdered, then it's taken to his family and his nearest of kin, those who have the right over him, to decide what to do. To decide what to do with him. If someone is harmed, if someone throw a rock at me and it pierced my eye, etc., I can decide what to do with it. All right, how do I respond to it? All right, do I want to retaliate? Do I want to take the, the idea, the, the, the money for it? Um, um, or do I want to forgive? It's my right or the family's right in this instance. But with the hudud, it's the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The had has to take place, the punishment must take place. And we have no say in that. Then you've got the third category, which is ta'zir. Ta'zir is in the absence of any revelation from Allah to say this is the punishment for this crime right? so it's not from the hudud nor is it from the jinayat and nor is there um, a, an expiation for that sin then it's from the ta'zir ta'zir means the khalifa will decide what the punishment is and he's allowed to adopt it so he can make it jail time he can make it a couple of lashes he can make it a fine he can forgive right? this is called ta'zir and the fourth type, right, and all of them, those three categories, are upon the haram areas, right? The, hal- the fard or the haram, right? And the last one is called al mukhalafat The mukhalafat is when you go against what the Amir had decided. He's given an order, a command, and you go against it, right? Or you're found to be um, against it. Or it's a, it's, it's a lower level of those others, for example. And so. Again, the punishment is set by the, the Khalifa at that time. So the sins upon which are part of the hudud, which is really the majority of uh, what, what we really want to understand today and take away from today, they are set by the sharia. Right? The sins which have the had punishment in Islam, the sharia sets them and they are six. And, and some classify them separately and make them seven, some a few more. But these are the ones generally agreed upon by the scholars. And they are zina and homosexuality, right? So zina, adultery or fornication, and homosexuality, right? Qadhaf, which is the false accusation and slander of chaste women. So falsely accusing someone of of zina or accusing someone of zina without the correct number of witnesses. Even if you saw it, but you're you're only witness, you're not allowed to say anything on it, unless you're a husband and wife and there's a separate uh, uh, li'an for that, a process by which you go to court and you swear against each other by Allah, etc. Different, different story. So it's zina and homosexuality. It is false accusation of, of zina. It is drinking alcohol has its punishment set by Islam. It is stealing and theft. Apostasy, leaving Islam, right? Not leaving kufr or leaving anything, right? Um, leaving Islam. If you were Muslim and you left Islam, right? That's capital punishment. And fighting. Fighting here is um, rebels, and it can be even the, the, uh, the highway robbers, right? So rebels against the state or the highway robbers that, that, that create such fear, spread fear by robbing the people publicly and no one wants to leave their home because of them, etc., right? These people are all punished by 
the, the hudud punishments. Right? So they're the rights of Allah. No one's allowed to pardon those people, not the ruler, nor the family. Right? And they're called the hudud, right? the, the, the limits, they're called the had, the, the separator, right? um, because they pre prevent the sinner from returning to the sin for which he was given the had in the first place in the majority of the cases. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilka hudud Allah, fala takrabun. Fala takrabuha. Verily, these are the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so do not approach them. Stay away from them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, and that's in Surah Al Baqarah. So the hudud are the first type. We mentioned they were what? Zina and homosexuality. And we'll go through those in a, in a short moment. It talks, we talk about the false accusation of zina. We talk about drinking alcohol, stealing, theft, apostasy, and, and, and fighting. Right? And fighting the, uh, the state or the highway robbery. Now we go to the jinayat. We said they're the hudud. The jinayat, for example, they're designated for anyone that loses a life or a, a limb or, or gets harm to his body, etc. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, retaliation is prescribed to you in the killing. The free for the free, the slave for the slave, and the female for the female. So you can retaliate in that. And whoever is pardoned, something by his brother is permitted for him. So even a pardon is allowed. So the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, clarified this. And he said, whoever is afflicted by a blood or a wound, so whoever is killed, or his family is killed, or someone in his family is killed, or he's wounded himself, he has a choice of three things. Either he can retaliate, not himself, but through the state, right? Or he can take the blood money, right? Or he can forgive. There are only three options. And if he tries to go for a fourth option, restrain his hands. So if there's no other option for him, the Prophet is saying, if you want to do something else, right, restrain his hands. Like, you, like imagine someone gets killed and he wants to go burn his house down. Haram, prohibited. You can't do that. Right? So restrain him. The ta'zir, which I mentioned, right, they're the, the punishment for which the, there's, there's no had punishment set, nor is it part of the jinayat. Right? And there's no expiation. And it's up to the Khalifa to, do, to, to decide. And he, the Khalifa, is allowed to pardon and forgive somebody. And not only that, in this area, the Ta'zir, you can take into consideration, you can take into consideration the individual circumstance of that person. So you might have two people committed the exact same crime. Right? Under Ta'zir. Where um, the punishment is not set by the Shara. One person you can send to jail, the other one you can forgive and let go. One you can let go. Right? Because here you take into, into account the circumstances. So in this one, you might see it as being really bold and he had no shame in it. In this one, this guy's never had history of doing any crime or any haram and he fell into it under circumstances. And the Khalifa or the judge appointed in this time is allowed to issue the verdict of one or the other. He can pardon altogether or he can punish. The Prophet Sallallahu gave us a really good example of that, in that an issue of Ta'zir, he was one of the, the companions, he, he sort of attacked the, the, the justice of the Prophet Sallallahu He attacked the justice of the Prophet Sallallahu When the Prophet Sallallahu distributed some booties and, 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 or, or zakat and, and, and some money among the people, one of the companions said, verily the sake of Allah is not sought in its distribution. Yeah, he said, it wasn't done for the sake of Allah. It means it was done for something else. So he's accusing the Prophet Sallallahu And in this case, the Prophet Sallallahu pardoned him even though he did a massive sin deserving of a punishment. But it's up to the ruler at the time. And the Prophet Sallallahu forgave him for that and, and just gave him advice on it. And forgave him, subhanAllah. All right, so he was pardoned in that case. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that the Prophet Sallallahu said, make light Right? Make light of the stumbles, in other words, the mistakes of the people of rank, except in the hudud. So, okay, give people an opportunity. If someone falls into an error, someone falls into a mistake, and you find there is a doubt in the evidence that doesn't conclusively prove something, then give him a break, right? And even in the ta'zir, if you can, make it easier, right? 
guide them, warn them, etc. You don't have to inflict punishment every time. And she said and qualifies, except in hudud, because that's the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one's allowed. So the Prophet, he said, when people came to him after a person had stole from a wealthy family, they came, some of the companions said, Look, this person's from his family, such and such. Go easy. Like almost like hint at let them go. So the Prophet said, Wallahi, if Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, was to steal, I would have no choice but to cut in her hands. To cut her hands. Even if his own daughter was to steal. So don't come tell me to compromise because the rich. He said, Verily, the previous nations were destroyed because they used to punish the poor and let the free, uh, the, the rich people, go with all their, their crimes. And the last area we said was the Mukhalafat area, which was the punishment which the ruler inflicts upon the one who disobeys him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Obey Allah and the Messenger and those in authority from among you, and therefore that is a, a, a clear um, instance. In another hadith, the Prophet said, Obey my Amir, and the Khalifa of the Muslims who, who replaced me, verily he obeys me, and whoever disobeyed my Amir, then he has disobeyed me. So you, if you disobey, the Khalifa, the Amir of the Muslims, then you disobey Allah and you disobey the Prophet Muhammad So imagine, my brothers, in an Islamic society, right? You got the social system, the chastity is looked after, the political injustice system and accountability of the rulers, everything is running smoothly. You've got the economic system, you've got halal loans, the zakat is distributed, the sadaqah is distributed, um, young men are given free uh, riba, free loans, to get married, right? To set them up, right? So imagine an Islamic society set up like this. The, 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 in the social framework, the men and women are separated and segregated. There's no haram and nakedness being thrown in your face day and night, right? Everything is looked after. There's no monopolies destroying your business and creating chaos for you, right? There's only deen, Islam, progress, jihad to the rest of humanity, right? Imagine this vision here. Where taqwa is the first line of defense and everyone is joining good, forbidden, and evil, right? Now imagine implementing these laws. Now imagine implementing these hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you can see, if everything's provided for you, implemented in its totality, then you would be such, right? You, you, like you would be creating such, there would be such a travesty, a travesty of... Um, Injustice upon a community that everything's provided for you, yet you seek to take advantage of it. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of your rizq. He provides sustenance for you. You chose to get that sustenance in the haram. Right? So it's really important to understand that, you know, overall context. Um, in order that we can apply these. The problem is these days what happens is everyone looks to these punishments, especially the kuffar, and they say, man, you're cutting the hands of a thief. Right? Even, and so Muslims get affected by it. We say, bloody hell, you know. If we start, I mean, you look to the society that you live in, if we start cutting hands of the thief, right, half the people in Australia would be walking around with no hand. And it's true. They're all thieves. Right? Of one form or another. Right? They, they, they steal from each other, from their mothers, from their brothers, from their fathers, from their office, their employees, their employers. They steal from everyone on every level. Right? That's because it's a kufur system. So yeah, when you think about it, everyone will be walking around like this. Right? You got nothing. But under Islam, where everything's provided for, it's a different story. And like I mentioned, in the early years of Islam, after the revelation and the prophethood, you can count, when you look through the court um, manifestos, you can count on, excuse the pun, on one hand, right? Um, how many people had their hand cut off, for example. Maybe a little bit more than that. But you get the point that I'm trying to make here. If you were to um, punish, stone to death, the adulterers, the married people, or the fornicators, again, right, 90% of the country would be dead. Or walking around with 100 lashes, right, marks on their back. Right, because it's a kufur system. Right, so yes, they just get so overwhelmed. And the Muslims go, man, how can you implement that? Everyone will get belted, right? Everyone will get punished so severely. How can you keep up with it? Right? The issue is you want to implement on Islamic society in totality, in, in, in its whole, not in piecemeal. And it's very important we understand that point. So these hudud punishments, right? they need, all these hudud punishments, they need two witnesses who are just and male, men. 
right? And just. Just means adal, that they had no crosses against their name in terms of corruption and fusuk or, or open haram, etc. You need two of those witnesses. Or one man and two just women whose witness and testimony is acceptable. For all of them, except the zina. Zina requires four witnesses. And all of them have to attest what they saw exactly. Right? And if you don't have it, then you're punished. You're punished with 80 lashes. Did you know? Because so, so, it's considered false accusation now. If I say, this person had sexual relations such and such, and you can't back it up the evidence, right? You're slandering now. If you don't have the evidence, right? You, 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 you've slandered and destroyed a family. Right? It's not like the Kufar society, the Kufar society, they slander everyone. Right? You can go to the president, right? The leader of the whole world at the time, and you can say, this is what I did with him, right? And he'll stand up and say, I did not have sexual relations with this woman, right? But you can do that. You can slander anyone you want, all right? Whether king, queen, president, peasant, whoever you want. But under Islam, this is prohibited. This is haram, right? The Prophet ﷺ, and in absence of those witnesses, you can't do anything. The Prophet ﷺ knew one woman was a prostitute, and she was acting as a prostitute. Right? And he knew because he said, we know by the way she talks, what she says, it alludes to it, how she dresses, and the men that frequent, right? that, that travel in and out of that area. And it was clear that he did not grab her and punish her. And he knew, certainly, it's the Prophet of Allah, he knew. But they did not punish her with the stoning of adultery because they didn't have the evidence stipulated by the shara, which is the four witnesses. They did not have that. Now, for zina, you can, get the, you can get punished one of three ways. Either you have four witnesses, you have a confession, or you have a pregnancy in the case of a virgin. Right? Virgin rocks up, she's pregnant. Sorry, that baby isn't about to um, um, defend you when it's born, as in the case with Isa, <coughs> alayhi salam. And so... In the case of zina, that is, that's how we look at it. In the case of homosexuality, Ibn Abbas said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever you find doing the action of the people of Lut, then kill the doer and the one who was done to. Right? Kill them. Ibn Abbas said, throw them off the highest building and throw rocks after them. Uthman radiallahu anh said, throw a wall onto them. Like, tumble a wall onto them. Ali radiallahu anh, he used to burn them, wanted to burn them. Or well, that was his offer to burn them. Even though the Prophet ﷺ said, do not punish by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes with. But he, has, he had his ishtihad and evidence for that. In the case of theft, all right, we're trying to just at least familiarize ourselves Bismillah, before we complete with um, some of these evidences, right? With theft, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah cursed the thief who steals, even if it's a helmet, all right? So his hand is cut. Even if he steals as well a rope, his hand is cut. Right? And so the limit for what a person steals is one quarter of a gold dirham. That's the nisab. And there are conditions for theft. SubhanAllah. What's so beautiful about this is you, you don't punish or cut the hands of a thief if, if it's in famine. Right? If someone's stealing to, to live and survive and eat and food, right? there's no food or water around, you don't cut anyone's hand during that time. And the item must be secured. It can't be just left around or he finds it in a paddock. Or that's not considered the theft where you cut the hand. Still accountable for it, but you don't cut the hand. And there are many other conditions as well. All right? Um, and it shows you that, again, we don't want to project these punishments on a society that we live in because it boggles the mind. Absolutely. And there's many, there's many concessions for it. The mercy of Islam is such that the Prophet Wasallam. It was narrated by Aisha that the Prophet ﷺ said, um, when inflicting the hudud, when, when issuing the punishment for a crime, if there is any doubt, then don't do it. If there is any doubt, any excuse you can find not to do it, then don't do it. Because it is easier for a ruler to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a day of judgment, having not issued a had, than to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, cutting a hand, for example, or killing a person when it shouldn't have. Right? I'd rather meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having not done a had when I should have than having done a had when I shouldn't have. 
right? Such is the mercy of Islam. So even though they call it barbaric, that, right? There are opportunities, there are chances, there, there are conditions, right? It's part of a holistic system. There are checks, there are balances. It is not done by every man, woman, and child, right? Even apostasy. So apostasy, a person who leaves Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that he is killed. Even if he was a non-Muslim, came to Islam, wanted to go back, his punishment is death. And because it is the greatest crime to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shirk, that you were on the path of Jannah and you decided to go to Jahannam after that and associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the greatest crime. If we use crime, the measurement of crime by our minds, again, we're fallible, biased, prone to our environment. But under Islam... Right? We, we, we refer it to the matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows what is best. So apostasy, yes, the punishment is death. And for the apostate, um, he, he is killed whether man or woman. Right? They are killed. And again, they are killed not by me, you, everyone else. They are killed by the Amir the, and his representatives. So the Khalifa and his representatives only. The highway robbers, similarly, they are killed as well. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يحل دم امرئ مسلم إلا بإحدى ثلاث. Said as a thayyib zani wa nafsu bi nafs wa tariku dinihi wa nufariku li jama'a. The blood of a Muslim cannot be legally spilt. You cannot kill someone except in three cases. The married person who commits adultery, right? A life for a life, so the murderer. And the one who leaves his religion and abandons the community, right? The jama'a. Right? These people, their lives are taken. Zani is in the same case as well. Their lives are taken, except the witnesses are a little bit different. And I can't, upon all of this, right, slandering the women, the drinking of alcohol, do you know what the, 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 the punishment for drinking of alcohol? It's a minimum of 40 lashes. Right? We saw that recently. Yeah? One of the brothers uh, strapped down one of his convert mates and uh, they gave him 40 lashes. Right? Again, the lashes are for the Khalifa to issue, not the individuals. All right? It's under a state. It's not even a group allowed to implement these. It has to be the state, the one in authority or his deputy who he has given it to. And accusing a woman without witnesses, again, we said that is 80 lashes. And all of this has to be done by the ruler or his representative. All right? There are courts, there is due process. All right? Um, they've got to look into the allegations. There are checks and balances. Everyone has a right to defend himself. Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, no one should establish a punishment on the free people except an imam and to whomever the imam gives authority. No one's allowed to implement the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except the khalifa and his representative. Imam al-Qurtubi said, there is no disagreement that the one who is addressed with the issue of punishments is the leader and the imam and his representatives. Right? Not, man, not every man, woman, father, son gets upset with his daughter, she comes home with a boyfriend, he kills her. No, no, no. It's not the case. Right? It's not even for groups or movements. It's for the Khalifa and none else. So, we need to understand, in conclusion, a number of points. Right? We know the political and ideological agenda of the Kuffar in seeking to demonize Islam, to create a secular version of Islam, to create doubt in the hearts and the minds of the Muslims. We do not want you to fall for this trap. You don't want to be on the defensive. Islam doesn't need defense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will defend the deen. Right? What it needs is for you to carry it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It is He, Allah, who sent the messenger with guidance and a deen of haq to make this deen prevail over the earth even if the mushriks detest it. So who's going to carry this haq to the humanity if it is not us? On the contrary, we should confidently challenge their way of life, the entire society, their individuals, their collectives, their politicians, their media, about the mercy of Islam that he can solve their problems. Let's put the laws on, on a scale and measure the crimes committed by the kuffar and their systems and their democratic values as opposed to the mercy and the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's system. And inshallah ta'ala we want to understand all of those and refer back to everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنُهُمْ Allah says, No, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they will not have true faith, O Muhammad, until they make you, you know, using the Quran and Sunnah, right, a judge between all their disputes. 
everything is referred back to Allah and His Messenger. And not only do they make you a judge, but they find no resistance in their hearts, but accept it with fullness of submission. So when Allah and His Messenger say this is the right and this is the wrong, this is the correct punishment and this is what's acceptable and this is what is not acceptable, that is our yardstick. We accept it with full submission. We do not defend it. We are not embarrassed by it. On the contrary, we take it to the kuffar as the mercy that will solve their problems, inshallah ta'ala, because wallahi, my brothers in Islam, they are crying out. Wa kuli kawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa alaikum wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.